Welcome everyone. We're happy you are joining us today. My name is Scarlett Reynoso and on behalf of my colleagues at Ethosphere, we are proud to kick off the third masterclass in our culture series around ethical culture strategy. Over the next hour, you'll hear from my colleagues Scott Stevenson and Tom Norton as we have an open discussion on strategies for ensuring your efforts to communicate and enable ethical culture are successful. We encourage you to engage and connect with us today by submitting your questions or chatting. As you can see, Erica Salmon Burton is here, live and ready to engage with you in the chat. If you have joined us for a webcast before, you know we love to take your questions. So please ask as many questions as you'd like in the Q&A or chat features. Please note, we may run over our allotted time at the top of the hour. If you need to drop, no worries, we are recording so you won't miss out on the last few questions. We are anticipating a handful of questions today, so we will try to answer as many as we can. And if we happen to run out of time, we will follow up with you via email. As I mentioned, today's session is being recorded and we will share access to the recording and presentation materials. Once you've closed out of the masterclass today, we'd love for you to participate in the post-event survey. Please take two minutes to let us know how we did. This event has been approved by the SECE for 3.6 live and non-live CCB CEUs. There are 1.2 available for each of our three masterclass sessions and details on how to redeem them will be shared in our follow-up email. That will also contain the recording and other presentation materials. I will now give the floor to Scott and Tom to introduce themselves before diving into today's session. Tom, Scott, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Scarlett, and uh, to everyone that has been able to join today, certainly appreciate you all taking the time. My name is Scott Stevenson. I'm a Director of Culture Services here at Ethosphere, and I have the distinct pleasure of being able to introduce my colleague, Tom Yorton, EVP and Chief Strategy Officer. Tom, if you want to take a quick moment uh, and introduce yourself, we'll, we'll jump right in. Sure, Scott. Thanks very much, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you today. Thanks for making time for us today. Uh, I'm relatively new to this space, to this field. Uh, I'm with Ethosphere now about eight or nine months, but I'm a marketing and advertising guy by trade. And while on the surface, that may seem to be different than the background that most of you have, I actually think what you'll find as we go through this conversation about culture enablement, uh, that the marketing and communications discipline is central to that conversation. So I'm really excited. You know, take the stuff that I learned in the first part of my career and share some of those ideas and insights with you today. And uh, hopefully it's a beneficial session for you. Hopefully we give you some tips and some practical guidance that you can put to work right away. So good to be with you and thanks again for coming. Well, Tom, thank you for joining and to everyone on the line. Um, I certainly come from the ENC space. So there was, there was a number of aha moments as we were prepping for today and speaking with Tom. So I certainly hope you all have kind of the same same reaction as we step through this. Um, before we get into the conversation about enablement, I do have to give a tremendous shout out to my colleagues, Erica Salmonburn and, and Douglas Allen. Um, Erica kicked off the masterclass series by talking about you know, the why behind ethical culture measurement. And then Doug, in uh, true to form, did a fantastic job displaying the kind of the how, if you will, of, of capturing the data that's going to be most helpful. So for Tom and I, today's conversation is we've got the why, we've got the how. Now we're here to discuss, all right, what do you do with that? Um, where do you go? Um, we're, we're talking ethical culture enablement. Quick housekeeping item. Sessions one and two are now available on demand. We're going to reference them throughout today's conversation. If you haven't had a chance to go and view those, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, again, Erica and Doug did some great work there. So today, in, in the context of enablement, what we're going to be talking about is um, setting the stage first by speaking to the obstacles of enablement. I think it's very important to ground the conversation there, understand some of the challenges and the pitfalls um, that we've seen here at Atmosphere in our collaboration with our partners. And then Tom and I, were going to shift into strategies for focusing your efforts. You kind of understand the opportunity in front of you. How do you take advantage of that? And how do you kind of achieve the needle shift that you know, we're all hoping for? And building that into, all right, we've got the strategy in place. How do we go about actually executing on that? And that's going to be an area, certainly lean on Tom's expertise and speaking to kind of some of the practical insights there. But first, I think it's, it's very important that we kind of ground the conversation here and ground our perspective in so many ways. Um, 
I mentioned before some of the aha moments that I've had from Tom. And when he joined us, he he initiated kind of a fundamental change here at Ethisphere in how we view culture, um, taking it from a thing or a noun and understanding culture as a verb. So Tom, would love for you to kind of share you know, what we mean by that as, as we lead into the broader conversation around life cycle and enablement. Sure. Thanks, Scott. I think uh, there's kind of a dictionary definition uh, in, in terms of the verb part of speech, uh, the definition of culture from Merriam-Webster is to grow something in a prepared medium. So that's one way to think about it. And when I think about culture in the context of what we're talking about in our work, uh, the topic of today's conversation, I think how that applies is you know, culture is a living, breathing, active, dynamic thing. It's not static at all. And everything we do, it's not enough merely to observe what's going on, to measure it, to understand it. Those are essential things. And we talked about those things in the first two master classes. But once you've observed where you are, how do you affect change? How do you improve? You have to take an active stance if you want to meet an active dynamic thing. Um, so if you think about this construct here that you see on the screen, to grow something in a prepared medium, I would argue that the work that we're all trying to do is to prepare our organizations, that's the medium in this case, to prepare our organizations for improved business integrity. That's what it's all about. And so when we say culture is a verb, I guess it works as a straight up uh, dictionary kind of idea, but it also works in terms of how we think about it. It's yep. an active thing and you have to take an active stance to affect positive change. Tom couldn't agree more. And I really like the emphasis there on kind of in a prepared medium. So as we step through this, you know, we're certainly sharing insights um, in our point of view based on our experience here. But thinking about your organization and, and the limitations, the opportunities, the resources, et cetera, I certainly hope everyone on the line is viewing what we're sharing today kind of in the context of your organization or your prepared medium. So what does this concept of, of culture as a verb really, really build to? And for us here at Ethosphere, uh, we've taken the approach and partnering with organizations uh, that culture is really a life cycle. Tom mentioned it's a dynamic thing. It's ongoing. Uh, so how do, how do we ground that, that perspective and make it approachable? So for us, we've distilled it down into four key questions. Um, you know, where are you today? That's certainly what Erica and Doug were speaking to in the first two master classes, kind of getting a sense of where your organization is at today. And for the remainder of this conversation, Tom and I are really going to be speaking to where do you want to go? How are you going to get there? And how will you know if you've made it? Again, this is a dynamic loop. It's a life cycle approach. Um, and that's, that's certainly how we're approaching it. And that's certainly where some of the practical recommendations we have today come from. So I mentioned at the outset, we're going to start by, by speaking to some of the potential pitfalls. Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. This is really where uh, we've seen organizations struggle. Um, now, I'm going to start by saying there, there's a number of issues. There's a number of obstacles. Uh, they are thorny obstacles. But the key takeaway we hope everyone has from today's session is that the cost of doing nothing is greater than the cost of taking action. Um, I think we're all ENC professionals and, and risk-based analysis is certainly forte. So speaking to the first obstacle, complexity. Um, these, these are not black and white concepts that we're all trying to communicate and inform and educate and empower our employee bases with. That makes conveying it out, out to a mass audience that much more difficult. Capturing attention. I think, especially in COVID times, we've seen our employee bases inundated with communications from every central function, uh, from colleagues as everyone's virtual, et cetera. Finding a way to pierce through sort of the white, proverbial white noise, if you will, and capturing attention, it is, it's a challenge. And it's a skill set um, that, candidly, I'm seeing more and more ENC functions try and staff for, um, or at least partner with. Legalese, um, there's a close association between ethics and compliance and legal, and for good reason. I think there's a great, great many of us that come from the legal field. Um, so dense legalese text uh, and copy tends to permeate the communications, at least you know, what we've seen here at Ethisphere. 
bandwidth. Uh, I think it's an open secret that ENC functions are notoriously spread thin. Um, budgets are relatively tight, so to speak. Um, so it, it's really an opportunity in, in cost-benefit analysis and identifying, all right, there's only so much of me, there's only so much of my team, there's only so much of our resources. How do we allocate this in the most efficient manner for the greatest greatest return? And then silos. Um, from, from my vantage point and from the vantage point of, of the data and services team here at Ethisphere, uh, we've certainly seen organizations uh, and functions specifically that have great working relationships with their, their sister functions, and that helps a tremendous amount. But more often than not, as there is in, in many organizations, there's a bit of a silo mentality, and functions are running at, you know, in some cases, a very similar problem from different directions and, and perhaps pulling in opposite ways. Um, so we're gonna speak a little bit today about the opportunity to break down those silos and piggyback off existing channels going there. All that's to say that frankly, this is, this is a really complex and complicated challenge. Um, it's not easy, but again, the cost of doing nothing far outweighs the cost of taking action here. So, Tom, I'm, I'm going to lean on you here to kick us off and talk about some of the ways that you can pierce through and land an impact, sure. if you will. Yeah, sure. I think it starts with this idea, something to remember that um, there is no such thing as a captive audience. Uh, we may think what, one of the great challenges, in, and I would argue in my experience, great failings with most internal communications and most corporate communications in any large enterprise is the idea that just because uh, you can reach somebody that they have heard your message. And I know we know that intuitively, but sometimes in the course of our day-to-day -day work, we forget that. And so if you remember what Eric and, and Doug talked about in the first two classes, uh, it's all about kind of sizing up where things stand. Where do you have strengths? Where do you have shortcomings? And if you're trying to close those shortcomings, invariably, you're going to have to communicate with people. Invariably, you're going to have to uh, get a message out to a broad audience. And we think there are three principles that ground everything that we do when it comes to affecting culture change and creating an ethical culture in a large enterprise. And we'd suggest that as you contemplate building your own programs, think about these three things. This idea, first of all, think in terms of a daily vitamin versus an annual inoculation. And what do we mean by that? Well, we simply mean that um, historically, uh, communication in this field has been somewhat episodic. There might be a compliance week or there might be an ethics week or there may be periodic communications, but there's really no steady uh, ongoing conversation that we're having with the vast audience that we're trying to reach. And so if you think about it as a marketer would think about it, there's no way you're going to get a message through a very cluttered environment if you're not there early and often. So we think in terms of frequency and we think in terms of recency. If that's how you want to get you need to adopt that mindset if you're going to try to seed any message, whether it's related to compliance or any other topic. But because we're talking about ethical culture and the need to move those, uh, make those, uh, make changes uh, in improvements in ethical culture, think in terms of more frequent communication. Does it have to be daily? Quite literally, not necessarily, but it has to be frequent and it has to be ongoing. Second point is this notion of dialogues versus monologues, and. Um, Think about this from a personal communication standpoint. How many of us like to be talked at? I mean, I don't think anyone really likes to be talked at. We'd much rather engage in a conversation where there's some give and take. And similarly, when we're dealing with a, a large audience um, in, in the corporate world and in your companies across many regions and business units, you also want to spark conversation. You want to use the content that you're putting out there to engage, but you also want that to prompt a conversation. I think that may be the fundamental distinction between um, marketing communication and legal communication. And this is not a fully formed idea now, because as I mentioned, I'm, I'm new to the space, but one of the observations that I've had is, obviously when it comes to legal communication, uh, you want that content to frankly minimize interpretation and minimize dialogue, you want to create stuff that is super thorough and comprehensive so it can be precise and prescriptive. And in that context, that makes perfect sense. But when you're trying to engage an audience, it helps to 
create shorter things or interesting things that spark a conversation and not stop a conversation. So we'll show you some examples of what we mean by that a little later in, in, in the presentation. And in the last point, uh, philosophically, we draw a big distinction between professional communication and corporate communication. Um, most companies exist in the corporate communications realm where everything is very polished and thorough and, and nice. And I would argue dismissible because of that. Often it doesn't cut through the clutter because think about your own inbox experience. Uh, you know how you sift that, you know, the stuff that never pops to the top and the stuff that'll never get you to click on it. And so what we invite our clients to do and what we are partnering with them to do is think in terms of professional communication. Um, and that can mean more informal communication. It can mean music. It can mean uh, video. It can mean cartoons. It can mean multiple things that help you land a message. Think about it this way. In, and in this sense, what we're talking about here today is every bit the same as what we talk about in marketing. You're trying to change behavior, right? And in order to change behavior, you have to change attitudes. And before you have a hope of changing an attitude, you have to get someone to pay attention. And so what we'd argue is that most standard communication never gets to that point. It never gets anybody's attention in the first place. So it can't hope to do the rest of the what it needs to do. So think in terms of doing things a little differently Think in terms of showing some, sometimes even showing some humanity and imperfection. We have one client, um, uh, it's, I believe it's Care First, one client who did a fantastic job with their executive team. Uh, they did a blooper reel at the beginning of a bunch of communication related to the compliance work that they were doing. And the reason they did that is to be approachable and to be accessible and to create the conditions where people were communicating person to person and there wasn't any kind of rank and there wasn't any kind of distance keeping people apart. So that's just an example of how you can create conditions um, where people will be willing to come forward and participate a little, a little bit more. So when you don't have a captive audience, you have to think differently. Sending a message is not the same as receiving it. And that colors all the work that we do and all the recommendations we make. Indeed. And Tom, before, before we move on from here, um, I think you make some fantastic points there. Uh, particularly calling out the Care First team, uh, Todd, Jennifer, and, and Brian over there. Um, work closely with them on that. That was that was fantastic. But I think Tom, what I really appreciate about kind of your your thematic approach here is that it's it's grounding the communications in the employee's reality or finding a way in approaching it in that manner. Because um, when we speak to enablement and we're speaking to ethical culture. By and large, a lot of the context is finding ways to create a psychologically safe environment for employees to raise concerns. And that doesn't always have to be just with when misconduct occurs, although that is certainly a primary focus. Um, but when people feel empowered to bring their voice and use it in their role, that's going to elevate every aspect of the business, um, the examples, idea generation, et cetera. So, we're really talking about finding ways to ground your communications in the employee's reality and facilitate organic conversations because that's really when it's going to take root. And as Tom mentioned, really influence action. So Tom, I know, you know we've, we've teed you up as, as sort of an outsider looking in, if you will, to the ENC world, um, although you're technically not new anymore, as you like to put it. But I really like the, the thought process when we were collaborating on this of, of thinking like a marketer. So if you wouldn't mind, let's, let's kind of walk through uh, some of these steps, if you will, or at least int introduce them, and then we'll, we'll go in greater detail in subsequent slides. Yeah, yeah, great. I'll high point these here, and then in the follow-up slides, we'll show a little, some examples of what we're talking about with each of them. And the first one, again, if you're thinking like a marketer, you're trying to target as much as possible because the more precise you can be with your target the sharper your messaging can be. There's this axiom in the marketing world that you'd rather uh, have a sharper nail than a heavier hammer. And that's the case also in the business world because we're not, most of us don't have the kinds of internal comms budgets where we're going to outshout other things. So we have to find a way to have a sharper message. And you do that by using data to target things. You can target employee levels, you can target regions, you can target business units. Um, you can also figure out what are the messages or what topic areas do you need to address the most. 
if you do a culture survey through us or anyone else, you'll get some very good data on where those where those pain points lie, and you can target your message. Empowering your people, um, that means none of us is going to get anything done if we have many thousands of people in our company. We're not going to get it done from HQ. We're going to have to empower other people to be our voice and deputize people out in the world uh, and out in the business units uh, to affect change through their conversations and their actions. And there are some specific ways that we can recommend to do that. Um, this notion of keeping it short, uh, again, respect the time and intelligence of your audience. That's another axiom. And so when you keep communication short and you do multiple communications in a burst, that's better than trying to do longer elaborate things. Um, using different styles and different modes of communication. That's also a big deal, not only for variety, but because people learn differently and you wanna be able to show up uh, in a way that everybody can access the message, access the message and understand the message. We'll show a few examples of that in just a second as well. And then lastly, kind of closing the loop is this idea of let's get smarter every day. Let's put things out in place, but as we're communicating with that daily dose, that daily vitamin, let's be tracking what's working. Let's figure out a way to mm -hmm. identify the most salient points, the things that are most important for us to change and get some good pre-communication measures and then follow up with post-communication measures to see if we've moved the needle. And then if we've done that, that'll, that's instructive. But also if we haven't done that, that gives us guidance on what we need to do differently going forward. So when we're thinking like a marketer, um, this is what we're talking about. I don't really think it's some hard to understand black box. I don't think you need to be a marketing professional to employ some of these ideas. And in fact, we kind of entered this conversation today in this, this masterclass with the notion that there are some very basic things that everyone can do to have greater success here. And so hopefully some of these ideas uh, will be useful to you in your own programs. And so, Tom, uh, again, appreciate you teeing this up. And I will always take the invitation to talk about data and finding what and how that can enrich your lives and, and enable effectiveness. Um, so in short, make data your friend. Um, you know, Tom mentioned, you know, marketing and, and communications doesn't really have to be a black box. Um, there are things that you're already doing with data that are going to go a long way in, in helping you in these efforts. So Doug, Doug Allen in Masterclass 2 talked quite a bit about overlaying data. Um, and the importance of that. So while I have a very biased opinion, and I think your culture data set is, is very rich and valuable, I, I truly believe our partners unlock its, its true potential when they start overlaying it with other data lakes or data pools, if you will, such as, such as their LMS data, such as Office 365 click metrics, such as their issue tracking system. Because when you start to pull together these multiple data lakes, you're going to answer three very important questions about who do you need to reach? Again, I have a handful of partners that overlay their LMS data, their culture data, and their t and &E data in particular, and they use that to issue some just-in-time training with respect to travel. Now, this is obviously pre-COVID, but I think, I think the example still remains um, as important as, as we all Hopefully, you're coming out of, of the deep freeze, if you will. And then you're going to start finding out what, reson what messages are resonating. You know, Tom queued up kind of understanding effectiveness, measuring and improving. Uh, for us, what we really try to encourage organizations to do is take perceptions of the function and overlay it with click metric data. Um, understanding if I'm sending emails to a particular region and nobody's accessing the links or downloading the materials that I'm embedding in that, that, that's a pretty solid flag to understand. All right, I might need to change up the modality a little bit here. I might need to condense the messaging. Something isn't working in that particular region. And then understanding who is succeeding. Um, this, this one in particular, I'm, I'm particularly fond of uh, because you know I, we mentioned earlier grounding your communications in employees and managers' reality in allowing for organic conversations. So when you find the individuals that are championing the ENC message with great success, you're going to want to highlight them. That peer-to-peer -peer exchange is going to be incredibly valuable. 
And, and that leads us to kind of the next point here about making those individuals the stars. Again, grounding this communication. So finding those individuals, using your data to find where you've got great communicators. Put them in some sort of medium. We're seeing individuals uh, put, put great leaders um, and strong communicators in videos much more frequently than we have in the past. I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, to provide, you know, to map out actions for leaders and managers. Um, they're the crux of everything when it comes to how you can influence your culture. That is perhaps your most potent lever uh, that you can pull is, is finding ways to encourage leaders and managers who employees across the workforce are looking to as, a, as the way to get ahead, the roadmap, if you will. If you create buy-in amongst those individuals, you're you're well. You've, you're ahead of the game in so many respects, and um, anyone that has partnered with us with respect to measuring culture understands. You know, we encourage use of the carrot, not always the stick. Um, so, finding ways to celebrate uh, the positive actions and and championing within your organization, and then tapping into existing channels. You know, we 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 kicked off talking about obstacles and silos. Um, and we talked about bandwidth. Sometimes you don't need to reinvent the wheel. As cliche as that is, it's certainly a pitfall we see so many teams running into. And then when we have an opportunity through assessment work, et cetera, and we find out their communications partners have, have certain templates in place that could re or have existing channels uh, and modalities of communication that an ENC function could really leverage to great success. So, Sometimes not always thinking about reinventing the wheel, but you know, breaking into existing channels. And in particular as well, um, one story stands out to me, an organization that's in the energy and utility space. They really were having a hard time finding ways to get managers to commit to ENC related conversations. Uh, they tried a few different things. It just simply, it wasn't working. And then they found a director uh, in one of their, their solar businesses that uh, actually had, in their free time, created a widget of sorts, a Wheel of Fortune style widget that had, they had come up with various scenarios that they had experienced in their time at the organization and had heard anecdotally from some of their peers. And while they kicked off every meeting per protocol with a safety moment, uh, given the field, this manager actually started employing this Wheel of Fortune widget, and it turned into a great thing that quickly spread through the, the department. The NC function had no idea that was happening, um, that a director had gone about creating a medium that was effectively leading to these conversations. Well, it didn't take long, that was adopted and, and shared widely. And that's one example of, of finding ways to be creative um, and tapping into existing channels. Hey, Scott, can I offer another way to be creative? Just Absolutely. an example. It goes to the first star on the left, this idea of putting great communicators in videos. And I think what everyone's kind of on the video wagon right now. So I think people understand the value of that medium. But there's a sameness that I see in a lot of the work that's out there, often because we're going to the, the senior most people in every organization. And that's fine. We want them. We need to hear from them. But uh, just as well, hearing from people, uh, you know, the, the rank and file, the, the line level of associate can be very powerful too. People love to see their peers in communications. And we have one example of a, a client that I worked with eight or nine years ago in a very different context, but it was, a, it was actually a safety video in a hospital around infection prevention. Um, so there was a compliance aspect to that. And this woman was an amazing blues singer who created a simple blues song about washing hands and cleaning hands and so it was it blew up it was the most powerful thing they did in their in their corporate communications that entire year it got them a really important message across in a crystal clear way and it mm -hmm. was able to shine a spotlight on one of the the regular employees and so the buy-in and in the acceptance of that kind of a message is great now, I'm not saying that you all go and try to run that play in your own organizations I'm just illustrating that you have um, within your ranks, you have compelling people and you have strong people who can help you tell the story that you want to tell. And if you can find them, put them to work no matter where they are in the employee pyramid. And Tom, 
I am absolutely going to take that segue and and jump into managers. Um, again, for forgive anyone that has joined us before. When we talk culture, we inevitably end up talking managers and the importance of them. And I mentioned before, you know, that by and large is because they're the individuals that are are setting the standard and setting the roadmap for how I get ahead. And so, thinking about it from your audience's perspective. You know, messaging coming from those individuals is going to be extremely potent. So here, we've just put up some figures to show the relationship between that we've observed in our data set uh, of just how influential managers can be. So we measure perceptions of how frequently an employee believes their manager discusses ethics and compliance-related matters. And when we cross that with other key areas of perceptions, we find things like individuals whose manager is at least quarterly discussing these topics is more than twice as likely to be comfortable approaching their manager with concerns or questions. And so that certainly seems intuitive, right? Um, so why is that important? Well, the other, the correlating data point that we see is individuals that have observed misconduct and reported it, 60% of those individuals did so to their immediate manager. That is far and away the most used reporting mechanism we observe in our data set, as compared to just 23% of individuals that use the hotline and sub 5% that are using a web reportal, web reporting portal. So again, making sure employees are approaching, are comfortable approaching their managers is going to go a long way in achieving kind of the, the principal task of any strong ENC function that is mitigating people created risk. Finding ways to make them comfortable, employees comfortable when, when they need to speak up. Individuals whose managers are speaking to ENC related topics, they're 90% more likely to have faith that the organization is committed to non retaliation, uh, preventing non retaliation. And that goes a long way when we observe that participants who are unwilling to report or did not report observed misconduct far and away the most cited reason is that they were concerned about retaliation. Um, I've certainly had the privilege of working with organizations, rough, roughly 90 organizations to this point. And that, that holds true across just about every data set that, that I've had the privilege of working with. And so individuals whose manager is talking about ENC related topics, are also 24% more likely to believe they have a personal responsibility in making sure the company does the right thing. Now, that 24% might not stand out as much uh, in a vacuum, but the benchmark figure we have for that is, is that roughly 92% of individuals agree with that. So with that 24% bump, we're moving into a, a near unanimous consent that individuals feel they have a personal responsibility to make sure the company does the right thing. And that's what we're talking about here today, enablement. So Taking that figure and, again, tying it back to finding, the, finding opportunities to put people leaders at the center of your communications, grounding it in that organic kind of discussion, not a lecture, and having them share those experiences, spotlighting those, is going to go a long way in making sure that you've got a culture where it's ingrained amongst employees that we're all moving in the right direction in, in an ethical manner that frankly, protects the organization, which ultimately protects all our stakeholders. And so, Tom, I'm going to be curious, as always, to get your thoughts on kind of this, this bullet list here. But from a practical standpoint, we've talked about the importance of managers. You know, how do you advise them? You know, what are some, some things? And you know, here, we're, we're going to stay true to our word and keep it simple. Communicate regularly. Lead by example. Keep calm. I'm going to emphasize that keep calm point because that's something we're seeing a lot of leading organizations really look into is, is finding ways in their leadership academies, their manager-specific training to educate managers and raise awareness to failure response. How, how do you as a manager receive bad news or difficult news, I should say? So keeping calm there, sharing examples, be an active listener, and perhaps most importantly, follow through. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about managers and, and the importance uh, and the standard they set. 
It's important that they take the message from the ENC function, from the leadership teams about how we want employees to conduct themselves, and they follow through on that. It creates a sense of accountability that um, no amount of communication can replicate. So, Tom, again, curious if there's anything you'd like to expand on here before we jump into some examples, if you will, of how to achieve this. I think these are all well said. And just uh, respecting the reality of the lives of the people we're working with, um, this is not their day job. And um, so they're, they're pressured with many other things. So we want to arm them to be able to do these things as well as possible. We can't assume that they know how to do these things. And across a large organization, obviously, there's going to be a wide range of skill and experience at any of these things. So creating toolkits, playbooks, content, those kinds of things that help people understand how to do the things that are on these six points on this page, that's super important in giving, improving their chances for success. That's how you're going to engage managers and that's how you're going to affect positive change. So that's the only thing I'd elaborate on that. And I think we can go to the, the next. Uh, Indeed. Because what, what I'd like to do here uh, for everyone is uh, there's two slides I want to show, two examples of content um, to illustrate some of the points that we talked about earlier. We talked about this daily, uh, this daily uh, vitamin idea. And so you want to put out short, interesting messaging, right? Here's an example of something that we just created as part of a new Ethitune series. Um, and it illustrates a few different things. One is the idea of less is more. This is a captionless cartoon. The picture tells the whole story. Uh, in this case, it's a situation where it's, it's around a reporting situation. How do we feel about speaking up? How forthcoming do we want to be? Or do we feel some kind of fear that someone is looking over our shoulder, someone is looking at us askance for raising an issue or, or bringing up a, a thorny topic. And so this is the kind of thing that you could use a variety of different ways. Um, you could use it to kick off a meeting or a town hall conversation if this was a theme that you wanted to talk about. You could embed this in online learning in a training program to, uh, you know, to run adjacent to speak up kinds of training. You could put it in a newsletter. You could use it to kick off a small stand-up meeting if you're a manager doing a 15-minute stand-up uh, meeting with, with your direct reports, those kinds of things. So um, this idea of a picture's worth a thousand words, appealing to people who learn differently, who resonate differently, those kinds of things. And, and above all, just respecting the time and intelligence of, of your people enough just to put, mm -hmm. if you put these kinds of messages out on a regular basis, they're going to take away a few things. One, they're going to take away the idea that you truly understand their world and their reality, which is super important because you want to build a relationship with them where they know you and trust you and, and vice versa. And they're more inclined to pay attention when messages come across from, from your office and, and your function. Um, and then secondly, these can just these can just stand apart from so much that's going on out in the world. So uh, again, whether you, this is not a pitch for this particular thing, more it's around the idea of using imagery and using short form content like this to land points. Indeed. And Tom, before we, before we jump to the next slide for me, I always like to anchor back to, to previous points made. We talk about data layering and, and this is an example of, uh, a potential opportunity where this modality might not work for every audience you have um, in, in so many cases. So this, this could be something that you look at and, and you identify a potential pocket where you know, you, you've sent some text, you've sent some policies, et cetera, but maybe we're, we're going to land, land the plane, if you will, with a visual and then just simply link to the material that we need there. Um, Bingo. I, it's something grounded in, you know, that principle of less is more in so many respects. So I personally, I obviously I have a bias here, but this is a, a tremendous example. And I've seen the practical application of it where a few of our partners have been able to, to really break through in some instances uh, in markets that they were previously struggling with. Great. So, so we talked about, about, yeah, let's do this. And, and I want to speak to this to, to everyone. Um, what's it like What's it like to put a face on the data? Think about that question for a second. So many times, you know, we, we spend a lot of energy learning exactly where things stand. But then once you get that learning, how do you convey it 
to people so that they can act on that information and they're motivated to act on that information. This is, um, we're gonna play a short video, it's under two minutes, um, that does exactly that. It's a, a new video series that we've created called Tip of the Sphere. And this is where we uh, provide tips to managers that are grounded in the data that we've collected from our culture surveys, over 1.2 million respondents now. So uh, we'll just play this and then we'll unpack it after the video. Mr. Watson, come here, I wanna see you. Those were the first nine words spoken through what we now know as the telephone. Little did Alexander Graham Bell know what he was about to unleash in 1876. Of course, today you're more likely to see an acronym or an emoji, but the premise remains the same. People need to be heard and seen. But who do employees reach out to first when they need to report misconduct? The answer may surprise you. Consider this. When a manager regularly communicates about ethics and compliance, their employees are two times more likely to approach with questions and concerns, whereas only 23% call an ethics hotline. The result? Managers matter more than you think in creating and elevating an ethical culture. Here's something else to consider. Employee satisfaction in reporting to their particular manager varies significantly. Employees usually find themselves in one of two camps, very comfortable or very uncomfortable reporting misconduct to their manager. That's a problem. Why no real middle ground? Well, those who are uncomfortable cite that they did not believe their anonymity would be respected. Here's the good news and today's tip of the sphere. As a leader, you can create and elevate your own ethical culture by equipping your managers with the skills and insights they need to handle the reporting process. And if you're a manager, understanding your role in the process is critical. The data suggests that your actions can either amplify or diminish someone's willingness to come forward. When an employee spots a problem, let's make sure they know who they're going to call and that they feel great doing it. Uh, again, we're trying to use real hard data, real hard information to instruct people and give them ideas on how they can act in the way that we want them to act. So the point here uh, on this slide is that there are a lot of different ways that you can reach people and a lot of different learning styles. So whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether it's a screensaver, a poster, or a newsletter, whether you engage people in an interesting story in a town hall, traditional presentations or infographics, you want it or quizzes, lots of other things that can be out there. And I know there are some very creative people in this field. This is just a sample of a couple of things. The idea is really um, just use the, the full range of tools at your disposal because your audience will appreciate it and you'll be able to hit people uh, who learn different ways in a better way. Indeed. And Tom, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, the one point of emphasis I'll make is, is that last bullet here in storytelling. Um, over the last couple of years, I can't tell you how many different ways I've seen folks in this function leverage storytelling to great success. Um, that, that has far and away been the most potent, potent tool in their tool, but toolbox uh, when it comes to really trying to have the content and the messaging land. So wrapping that again in managers, wrapping it around data. However, you can find a way to do that. Um, storytelling is something I just, I cannot emphasize enough um, in, in so many respects. I frankly, Tom, quick anecdote here, had one organization um, that has a heavy manufacturing presence in uh, the APAC region. And they had a, uh, an SVP of sales get up in front of the entire town hall get up in front of roughly about 6,000 people and share a story about how a potential customer with a not insignificant uh, contract on the line began intimating that they, they needed a vacation. And it was something that ultimately was properly escalated, et cetera. And uh, that SVP was, was then in a position of, you know, obviously this isn't how we do business, um, and, and took appropriate actions there. That was a moment they were celebrating on stage. They technically they didn't win. They didn't win the contract. They lost business, uh, if you will. And that was a moment that the entire organization in the region was celebrating. And when we ran their culture survey, 
uh, after the after the fact. Uh, it was a noticeable jump. It was. It's really hard for me to underscore uh, properly underscore just how potent that was. So again, we've talked about you know leaning on the carrot, not so much the stick. We've talked about finding you know different mediums to deliver the messaging. Um, but again, really emphasizing getting managers, getting leaders. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily always mean by title uh, as well, mind you, um, and finding ways to tell stories. I, I just can't emphasize that enough. And so, Tom, it kind of the, the, the final section we need to get into is perhaps the area that, that I see a number of organizations fall short most frequently. That's going to be the feedback loop. That's going to be kind of that opportunity of measuring you know, what's actually working here. So curious, you know, your thoughts uh, in this space of, of what metrics and, and what approaches uh, you might, you might uh, advise the audience on as, as we set them forth. Yeah, I, I think just to close, this is, this is important. You, this is kind of managing your own expectations, but also managing the expectations of those around you. The cultures don't happen overnight and they don't change on a dime. If you're a 50,000 person organization on five continents, that, that's, that's, a big, that's a big tanker that takes a long time to turn. <laughs> so you have to have an expectation that you have to be at it in a steady way over time. That does not mean that you can't make good gains on particular topics or issues. And so that's the point. It's, it's both a marathon and a sprint. So again, if you identified that there are one or two key issues in your culture that you needed to attend to, you could have uh, a very concerted effort uh, to focus on that particular topic. I'd suggest do, you have to do pre and post research. You can't just guess. So you're going to have to understand where you stand prior to a communications campaign. And you need to think in terms of campaigns. It's not just in terms of I sent an email out or we had a we had a town hall meeting. It's an ongoing campaign. I think we've made that point. And then after that period of time, maybe it's a year, you can do a pulse check and see where you stand. And obviously, if you see the gains, uh, then that's that's encouraging you to continue. And if you don't see gains, maybe that's where you do another form of research. Maybe you do some focus groups and you get inside and try to find some of the qualitative barriers to getting that message across and not getting where you want to go. So the only reason we put this in here is just to understand we want to be realistic. We know that it's a complex problem. We know it's these are difficult topics and we know it's a very noisy environment where people are distracted by a hundred other things. So you want to mm -hmm. view it for the long haul, but you also can pick a couple of points where you can gain traction quicker. Amen. Hey, Tom and Scott, uh, yes, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna voice a God here in uh, uh, just for a second because we've got a couple of great questions that came in via the chat Please. that I'd love for you yeah. all to to take on right here. So the first, they're both related to this idea of stories um, and ethics moments. So can you um, go into a little bit more detail and perhaps some examples of what really is an ethics moment? How can you utilize it? Um, and then by stories, do you mean case studies or are you talking about something uh, less formal, more formal, kind of what, what's expand a little bit on, on what you mean by stories? Scott, you want to take that? You have a couple examples and then I'll talk a little bit more about the qualitative that, side of story. That, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic question and, and one we receive often. Um, I think case studies can be stories and stories can be case studies. We can, can certainly be one and the same and they can also be mutually exclusive. So um, a, a case study is obviously going to lay a lot more context and, and ground it, et cetera. Um, but with a story, you know, one example that comes to mind for me is um, a, an executive recently that we were dealing with. And um, he was having a particular challenge uh, in a region. Um, <laughs> I got to be careful here. And he was he was having a particular challenge um, with some of the numbers and some of the pressure that was was being felt. Um, they ran a survey and employees in that region really indicated uh, from their sales arm really indicated that they were experiencing pressure to compromise company standards to achieve business goals. And that that executive, you know, swore up and down. This is there's no way this this is accurate. You know, how is it that we do this? And what they ultimately found out is when they skipped down a few levels, uh, their managers that were actually communicating directly with field reps in the region 
we're simply communicating the objectives, the sales objectives. There was no mention of how being just as important as the what, so on and so forth. And it sort of hit the, the executive of this region like a cold water in the face that, you know, I'm not necessarily making these ethical decisions out loud, if you will. I'm not emphasizing to my team, my direct reports, how it matters just as, just as much as what. And so what the EMC function was able to do is, is take that moment, put it in kind of a fireside chat standpoint, and it, was, it expressed vulnerability for that executive, but it was a moment where they were able to then highlight how they changed their behavior and really led to some dramatic improvements in the region, not only for that sales function, um, but throughout the business when we came back roughly about 11 months later and, and reassessed pressure. So great question. Yeah, and, and I know we're, we've got a lot of questions in tight time, but I do want to give one additional example that I had from a prior life. This is a different form of story. Um, we did a, about a two-minute reel of, I'll call them person on the street, man on the street interviews, where we ask employees, have you ever seen um, retaliation in your office? Give an example when you've done that. And so basically, it was it was a cut together segment of probably 25 to 30 people who some of whom had never seen it and uh, couldn't fathom having it. Some people expressed it differently and in, in, in they hadn't seen it. They had experienced it or they had had friends witness it. And so it was just, again, through the words of real people, it wasn't a story per se, but it was a collection of insights that spanned the range of what the population was feeling on a particular topic. And that was used to springboard a conversation around it with leaders of the company. So um, not a story per se, but an engaging way of real people talking about the topic in a real situation, as opposed to uh, coming at it from a policy mm -hmm. point of view. Yep. And Tom, if I may, just kind of to put a bow on some of this, and this is um, certainly my point of view, uh, but with risk, when we talk ethics moments, I've become increasingly fond of thinking of ethics almost in terms of leadership. Um, so when you think ethics moments, uh, I've, I've been advising folks to, you know, maybe elevate it necessarily from just ethics because that can really connotate a number of different emotions, feelings, you know, personal biases come out um, in, in a much wider variety than how people feel about leadership, which is ultimately what we're trying to get to. So for me, ethics moments are moments that really define the tone of leadership and the type of leadership you want employees to display within the organization. You know, so I shared an example of an executive, but I think um, there's, there's tremendous value in, in finding those moments uh, deeper in an organization where employees um, took the time you know, to, to band together and, and saw an opportunity in their community and their immediate community and their immediate surroundings. And they took it upon themselves to lead initiatives in some ways. Um, yeah. that, that is a moment of leadership that doesn't necessarily scream ethics, um, but what it does is it, it, it shows employees collectively owning that as an organization, our, we value our stakeholders in our community and, and we need to take action um, because we can. And yeah. so for me, I, I, just to put a bow on that, ethics moments, I also view, frankly, as, as leadership moments and like to try and elevate that concept a little bit. Erica, do you have another question? Um, yeah, so we got a um, we got a great question that came in um, via the chat function. Um, actually, the, uh, the the interesting one is is about the mo the uh, the one that I wanted to pose to you guys was about the modalities. So, mm -hmm. how much is too much in a in a manager toolkit? Right? What are the pieces that should be included? You know, at what point are you going to hit uh, kind of a level of of, of content that is going to cause people to you know brain freeze. Um, so just mm -hmm. your, your thoughts on, on what makes for a good toolkit. And just so well, you guys know, I did chime in that, um, you know, the, 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 the key thing is to give managers lots of options so that yep. whatever it is they're using sounds like them, but would love additional okay. thoughts if you guys have. Them. So Erica, I'll, 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 one, I'll say finding a way to make it organic is, is spot on. Couldn't agree with that more. Um, when, when somebody is rehearsed, sharing a rehearsed speech, 
um, it's really not going to land, frankly. So uh, give managers options, uh, give them the opportunity to choose and select. Um, you know, it's certainly what it's, it's the most, the psychology of it. Um, but how much is too much, uh, you know, and where do you go? I'm going to circle right back to the data conversation and taking advantage of the metrics that are available to you and letting that guide you. Um, and so taking culture data and taking training data, uh, for example, with, with LMS data, you can see time to completion and how long it took for a particular manager's um, direct reports to reach 100% completion, if that's the target. And you can see when they did it. Did they all start strong out of the gate and everyone kind of rushed to do it? Or were they the group that waited uh, to, the, to the final deadline day and everyone rushed to complete it? There? And you know, that's something that can indicate maybe that's, that's not a priority in the business. So I might approach that manager or that group differently than the former where, all right, you know, there, there's buy-in already there. Now I need to, I can fine tune it. I can approach, you know, more, you know, advanced topics in some respects um, around retaliation, around, again, active listening and failure response. So data is going to be your friend in deciding kind of how much is, is too much and what's the right balance. I think you need to curate it. Um, and we've created a manager toolkit where we built the spine of the toolkit around four key topics. We kind of call them the core four that come out of mm -hmm. our uh, uh, culture work. And those are ethical tone, speak up culture, organizational justice, and organizational pressure. So we've created discussion guides. We've created uh, content uh, like the stuff that we showed you all today. Um, and we tried to prepare people to have conversations around those topics. Are there many more topics that managers could have conversations about? Of course. But we, we thought that kind of the 80-20 rule applied that through the work that we've done uh, in the data that we've gotten, um, those were the most common areas, the most common gap areas mm -hmm. that we saw across the span of our clients. So curating is important. It's yep. funny. It, it, I, got a, I got a mechanics toolkit for Christmas last year, literally a toolkit. Um, that had, I don't know, 150 pieces, and I'm likely to use eight of those in my lifetime. So I know exactly what you mean by having way too many tools and not enough uses for it. And, and Tom, just I'm going to take that segue and, and anchor back even to the feedback loop we're talking about. Um, don't be afraid to ask managers. Again, use, use the resources at your disposal, but try and don't be afraid to ask managers what they need. Um, and, and that's, that's going to be pretty powerful as well. Um, so when we think about, you know, what's too much and what to include, it also ties into the feedback loop and, and this opportunity to understand if what you're providing is what they actually need in the moment. Again, grounding it in their reality is going to be the way you can achieve, uh, most effectively achieve change. So uh, that's that's just another point I really try to to emphasize is you know obviously you can't you know a lot of us we can't put boots on the ground right now but um, the focus groups are going to be your friend uh, both during and after the development and deployment of toolkits leadership academies whatever you have in the mix um, and Lorraine uh, so the core four if you will uh, saw that saw that there that Tom mentioned is really going to be speak up culture done from the top, perceptions of organizational justice and perceptions of pressure. So uh, those, those are going to be the core four uh, that at least here at Ethisphere, we've, we've built, uh, as Tom mentioned, the spine of, of our manager toolkits and discussion guides. Are there other thoughts or questions, Erica? I think um, let's let's cover where people can get some of you know some of the additional resources that are available, and we've gotten a lot of. Please make sure to send the slides, send the slides, send the slides, <laughs> um, and things along those lines, and also compliments on the series. So thanks, guys, for well, taking the time, and, and, and thanks to, to everybody on the line for sending in your great questions. Well, the visuals today, um, all credit goes to Ann Walker, uh, our, our colleague behind the scenes here, uh, did a phenomenal job. So thank you, Ann. 
And, and one, before I get to where some of the folks, uh, where you can get some of this material, um, to extend, uh, to expand upon Erica's thank you to everyone that joined the sessions or has, has watched them on demand. Thank you. Uh, we understand your time is valuable and, and you've got a lot on your plate. So for taking the time here. And on a personal note for me, um, this was a really fun exercise to go through because um, the first two master classes were fun to participate in, but this one here, uh, we were able to lean on the, the well of, of influence that comes from the community. Um, so a thank you to, to those that have been part of the Ethosphere universe in the past. Um, you've, you, you know we're beholden to you and uh, you've yet to lead us astray. So it's, it's thank you for that. It was fun for me on a personal note to reflect back on some of the lessons learned uh, as, as we thought about sharing with folks today. And speaking of sharing, um, you know, for those that are a part of the Bella community, hopefully by now you're, you're quite familiar with the member hub and, and the resources there. And I'm also really excited to announce the launch of the resource center. Um, so for those that need or are interested in information on the resource center that is not behind a paywall or anything like that, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out, but we've got a number of great resources, uh, that, some of which we spoke to today, available there. So please, you have our, our absolute permission to steal and, and make your own. And, um, you know, thank you, everyone, and certainly hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon, wherever you're joining from. And, and uh, good luck with the enablement. Take care, everybody. Thank you.